Glenna Jennings is an artist and educator whose work includes photography, curating, and socially engaged art. She is an associate professor of photography at the University of Dayton, Ohio, and completed her MFA in visual arts at the University of California, San Diego in 2010. She also holds BAs in English and Spanish from Pepperdine and a BFA in photography from Art Center College of Design. Jennings has exhibited throughout the US, Mexico, Europe, and China, and she has received several Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Awards and a Robert Rauschenberg Residency Award through Photolucida Photo Critical Mass 2019. Her work is in museum collections throughout the US and internationally, as well as in multiple private collections. She is actively involved in food justice issues in Dayton, Ohio, and beyond, and was recently awarded the Educator Food Champion Award at the 2019 Montgomery County Food Summit for her work with Desert Kitchen Collective. So it's really a pleasure to have you here, Glenna, and thanks for taking the time to share more about your work with us. I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, great. So I think everyone's able to see my screen here and this sort of subtitle I've created from one to many and back again, which hopefully will make sense soon. Of course, I first of all want to extend a huge thanks to Blue Sky Gallery, to Molly and, and Zemi and Chris and for providing this opportunity to me and welcoming me in spite of all of the restrictions, right, that are accounting for us meeting on Zoom today. Um, I also want to, to shake, thank my friends, Alan Shar Green, who have uh, been putting me up, putting up with me uh, for the past three weeks as I get to enjoy what it's like to be in Portland during a pandemic. But uh, I am currently on sabbatical from the University of Dayton. So that for that opportunity, I'd like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences and the Department of Art and Design. Um, I was able to sort of forge a safe route and drive all myself and my work all the way here from Dayton, Ohio. So I think it's important that I also acknowledge gratitude for the fact that I drive across occupied lands and I wanted to share blue skies. Ooh. Let's see, blue skies uh, statement of gratitude for land acknowledgement. We at Blue Sky humbly acknowledge that our programming is being held on the traditional lands of Multnomah, Katlatmet, um, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia, Wimal, and Willamette, Willamette rivers. So I'm sure my pronunciation was not, not good there, but I'm going to move along. Um, and I can no longer see myself either, so I think that's a good thing. So as I move through uh, this kind of overview of my practice, because I am going to go back a few decades, uh, I'm going to touch on certain themes that really reference this notion of the one and the many. I'm going to share a few little photographs here that were all taken on the site of uh, the future Gem City Market, which is a member cooperative uh, that's going to open in January 2021. And it's a big part of my life in Dayton, so I'll get back to that. But uh, for now, uh, this photo is sort of a stand in for the notion of looking at self, um, which is something that I think all of us do, but it's, a, it's sort of a part in the journey of the young artist as we're facing these sort of difficult conditions and feeling alone and wanting to discover ourselves. But uh, next, we are made to negotiate our relationship to the other and of smaller networks. And finally, uh, we, we really have to figure out who we are within the larger sense of community and, and the group. So the one, the few, and the many um, will appear in the sort of themes I'm gonna talk about throughout. In the meantime, here is a portrait of the artist as a young tomboy photographer, I guess you would say. And the camera, which is about the size of my head, was gifted to me by my father. So we weren't always super close. The camera became a way for us to, to connect. And uh, my father would take me to the Greenhead Duck Hunting Club. So obviously uh, this is a space for uh, shoot at animals, which is something I was not into. So my father gave me uh, the camera as something to do at that time. This is one of probably the first transparencies that I, I made back then as I'm sort of hunting the hunters 
And it makes me, of course, think of the earlier theories of Susan Sontag and the notion of, of photography as a kind of predatory activity that was pretty literal at that age, but not know it. Uh, my father was the, the town pharmacist. I grew up in a sort of semi-rural area. And so, like many pharmacies, we offered film development and photographs were just ubiquitous and everywhere at that time and we got them for free. So double prints, triple prints, whatever we wanted. And I think that I failed to sort of see photographs themselves as precious objects, but I did really connect to this notion of of capturing a moment and at that moment somehow still existed. I kind of think of it as not really an object, but a kind of reproducible for elsewhere. So this notion of reproducibility was also instilled in me at some point without my knowing it. Um, and when sharing my uh, sort of origins into the more formal art world, I'm so thrilled that my first photography professor, Britt Anderson is here today because in undergrad, back when I studied Spanish and English, I had always wanted to, to go to Art Center College of Design, but instead I embarked on a seven year career as an uh, English as a second or other language teacher. After which I uh, enrolled for a third bachelor's degree, a, ba a BFA this time. You can imagine how happy my parents were. Here's somebody who's already studied languages and now art. I mean, they were pretty dismayed. But uh, the first day of classes for my BFA was actually September 11th, 2001. So uh, that was indeed ominous, but I, I went ahead to finish that. And then I uh, enrolled in UC San Diego's MFA program. And the first uh, day of, of those classes, my father actually passed away. So I always say I was sort of, this is sort of introductions have to do with public and private with individual and collective tragedies, uh, but I did not get the message, I stuck, I stuck with it. And of course, after my father passed away, I was in San Diego and as an only child, um, I, had, I was responsible for sort of dealing with his stuff. And some of that stuff uh, consisted of 17 guns, but I'm not gonna talk about those today. Instead, I just share this dusty little clipboard that I found, which to me sort of, proved that my father, who had always been so distant, was also dealing with sort of quest for self-knowledge. Um, so when I had returned to, uh, for my third bachelor's degree, I was quite older than some of my other colleagues, which I now learn, now that I'm a professor, I know that I would be called an alternative student, which is, is kind of a cool name, but I think I wasn't considered cool at that point, and it was definitely not cool to have been a, a cheerleader in high school. But I got, I got close with my colleagues, and when I came out as having been a, a cheerleader, um, they said, well, why don't you go back and, and make work about that? So I did return to those origins. And I mentioned this too, and, and these themes of, of self and other and group, because you know, belonging to a, a sort of group that re represents conformity like this, was both important to me and it was also a struggle because I have sort of a difficulty with, with authority and uh, conformity. So flash forward to graduate school and I wanna share a few images from the series uh, Raskolnikov. And I'm gonna just read a description of this basically from my website. It's, uh, this project portrays 13 bodies wearing my high school cheerleading uniform and loosely reenacting scenes from Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. When I was 17 years old, I fell in love with the antagonistic protagonist of this Russian novel, who represented the stock character of an emotionally unavailable bad boy nihilist. The series creatively conflates canonic literature, personal memory, teenage angst, and adult uncertainty in non-site specific locations throughout Southern and Baja California. So basically friends, family, or colleagues who approached me with their own reasons for wishing to don this culturally charged artifact were included in the series. Their performances were often cathartic and almost always represented a confrontation or negotiation with gender norms and roles. 
So here you see this, this shack that's actually uh, on the property of the home I inherited when my father passed away. So I was thrust into this role of, of landlord, which has a connection with crime and punishment, if, if you are familiar with it. Um, and, and also, you can see I inherited a, a bit of a dump here. Uh, I'll point out that my friend, the artist Jesse Mockren, is under that table, and tables will be coming back soon. Uh, this is from a more a formal talk that I've given about this work, which looks at the history of, of cheerleading. But for, for this, I just want to point out that that's my grandmother and that she is the only person from the 13 people in the series who could actually button and zip up this skirt at that time. So tables emerge here again. Um, you can see that the it, there's a multi-generational sort of group of people in the series. And uh, by the way, the titles are all culled from a, a translation of the novel itself. And you'll also notice that identities are often obscured, which is pretty different from the At Table series. But many of the images shared this kind of attention to a place and space with lots of details and artifacts to help the viewer discover narratives and clues like that there's a, a literary scholar of Southern Gothic literature somewhere in here. So again, more tables, but at this point I was under them. Lots of reasons for that. Um, but I'll, I'll end talking about Raskolnikov, which is this image of the work at the Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, San Diego. So it's pretty similar to how I'm showing at table here given that the images are multiple sizes. So I like to work in this way because it kind of connects to the fragmentation of memory and it allows me to sort of formally play with hierarchy of size and negotiate different vantage points in, in certain work. So this, this space represents the kind of traditional white cube and allows me to introduce the, the next theme which is basically house and home. Also, I just want to look really fast because I realized I, I can't see anybody uh, anymore now. But I'm going to just go on ahead like that. We're so, still here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, so throughout the years since I was at Art Center, um, I had been managing and curating with an art collective called Compact Space. And that was founded in Berlin. But we basically ran these two different spaces in um, Los Angeles between like 2006 and 2010. And so those kind of places became like homes. So I do want to say that when you work, and I'm sure people at Blue Sky feel this way, when you work within these sort of spaces, they, although I'll refer to them in that kind of sterile concept of the white cube, they do start to feel very much like home and the people feel very much like family. But in 2010, we were forced uh, due to gentrification in downtown Los Angeles to, to close our final space. And in 2011, shortly after I was offered the position at the University of Dayton. Now in the, the home where I was still a landlady in, in Alpine, California, uh, my father's old home had recently been, the person had moved out. I decided, well, what better way to sort of leave uh, California than to host a really large show. So I invited 30 artists from San Diego, Los Angeles and Tijuana to exhibit uh, existing work or to come and like make site specific work. There's a lot of video and photography inherent in the exhibition, uh, but people also made stuff uh, for the outdoors. And, and this sort of represented a, a kind of exorcism of the home because it had long been haunted in my dreams, if not in reality, and I had written about that a lot. So, the collective act of having all these visitors and, and being able to finally sleep in the, the home sort of helped to exercise that. And, and I share it because this experience of inviting all these people to my home um, kind of shows how I continue to grapple with the one and the many and the sort of internal and external and the sort of need to create networks that are based on some level of emotional intimacy and not just surely on intellectual ideas or critical theory or that, that you know, kind of thing that we get often very caught up in as makers and students of art. 
So another transitional moment um, after arriving in Dayton, Ohio, I was basically alone and uh, had to learn about my new surroundings. My family, my mom is originally from Minnesota and she was really excited that I was returning to, to the Midwest, but I still had a lot to learn about the place and what better you know, situation to, to find than a photographic archive. And I'll also mention that one of my roles in my current position is teaching the history of photography. So I really turned to an organization called Dayton History and they are the custodians of the National Cast Register Corporation's photographic archives. So this is a, a lantern slide that shows the House of Usefulness, which was a home for quote unquote wayward male youths. Um, so it was started by NCR founder John Patterson, who had this kind of goal of doing a lot of philanthropic community betterment measurements. Not necessarily always for the purpose of community betterment, for the purpose of, of making money. He was a capitalist welfare guy. But, um, and if you're wondering, well, what is the National Cash Register? They make cash registers, yeah, beautiful symbol of, of uh, capitalism. You'd be surprised how one can spend years of their lives getting really distracted by cash registers. And I'll talk about that in, in a moment. But what I was really more interested in um, was sort of Patterson's notion of teaching through the eye. Because I believe I mentioned this was really the first corporation to consider housing an archive and to use photography to teach its sales force. He's also really into slogans. I think it says uh, heaven, hell, health there. He, was, he hung out a lot with Harvey Kellogg at that time and was uh, trying to enforce his ideas about hygiene onto people. So basically to uh, summarize this, move ahead here if I can. This multimedia project engages with, quote, forgotten visual histories of early capitalist culture by using NCR's corporate photographic archive to produce both studio-based and socially engaged art. My research interrogates representation of NCR social welfare initiatives at the turn of the past century with a primary focus on imagery of group calisthenics. So you see that here, this is, uh, these are activities that the, the corporation you know, required employees to engage in, but you see there's also younger people doing so here. They, they had a far reach. Um, but also on hygiene initiatives, which you see here, along with the title that the work has taken and its, its many um, variations looking at looking. So Patterson basically required all male employees to shower on premises daily, which I found quite interesting. <laughs> um, so I'll mention, again, I wanna move along. I realize I'm, I'm throwing out a lot of lines here, but the, the project has come to engage cross-culturally by using the NCR photograph as a playful, and intellectual catalyst for conversations about public culture and civic identity. And it has done this in Dayton, in Nanjing, China, and most recently in Ensenada, Mexico. Um, so the resulting thematically and conceptually related bodies of work include constructed photographs, documentary imagery, collage, public performance, conceptual wallpaper design, and functional objects. So I'll, I won't lead us too far astray by showing you a bunch of, of that work, because obviously that, that, that's a lot. And I got, it's one of the things that uh, once I had been in that space of the archive for, for, for a while, I really needed to escape back to a more live and active space of that, a table. But I, I share this because I also want to give an idea of my, what I was doing in all of those years as an earlier Midwestern transplant. But I do want to share a, a little bit about uh, that series as it relates to Nanjing, China, because that was also a big part of those years. I began uh, producing a, a lot of at table photography through b b this new relationship that I formed with the Nanjing University of the Arts. Um, I was basically working there as a professor and conducting workshops with Chinese students and uh, also working on some of my own research with graduate students. And I went back over a, a period of several summers. 
And at that point, I had culled certain images from the NCR archive, and I had to pay licensing fees for these. And they were single-use licenses to, you know, to use the photograph generally for the purpose of creating a single work. And there's still a lot of problematics in there with intellectual property law, but I just I was kind of irked by this because Dayton history, the custodians, they don't charge you to use their images in the same way. And so it felt like NCR had this far uh, capitalist reach. And so I thought I could really increase the, the single use value of these by showing them to a lot of people in public in China. Uh, so, and again, I, we brought these out into public spaces and on the right, you can see people on both sides, you can see people signing these images. And as they do so, they're basically sort of helping me enact the uh, fair use two thirds law, which says once the, the original image is transformed two thirds from its original, then um, it's no longer copyright infringement. So we were playing around with that. But the students uh, who served as translators and I basically conducted these interventions in public, visiting parks mostly, soliciting signatures and also commentary and making photos. It was a really lovable chaos. And I, again, won't try to, I won't go entirely into it, but we were sort of this roving mini archive. And this documentation and the related works were shown at the, uh, museum there at Nani and also at Pingyao International Photography Festival that year. But when I returned in, in 2016 and working with some of the same students and new students, we kind of wanted to reduce the, the chaos of that roving archive. So we wanted to create a set site for an installation. And um, I mentioned before that I taught English for, for many years as a second other language and I majored in Spanish. I am a super uh, basically language nerd. I love studying and I had started trying to learn Mandarin in 2013. And I'll say that in 2016, it, it was not going that well and, and it's not going great now, but I thought I might again solicit the public to, at this time to help me with my language learning. This relates back to work I had done between grad school and undergrad way back when. We had uh, one of our compact space galleries here in the Pico Union District and I set up this table in front of a Korean liquor store and I offered essentially Serbian, Serbo-Croatian lessons here to a public that was largely Spanish speaking. It's a Salvadorian neighborhood. So Yes, the intentions here were somewhat tongue in cheek and I was interested in this sort of intentionally absurd action of, you know, supposed generosity, but it was also really an excuse to disrupt our everyday environment, uh, which could get kind of heavy and, and also to just talk to people. So always an excuse to start conversations in unexpected ways. Here's some more views of the project. This was a really hot day, a really hot summer in Los Angeles. And this one of this girls is giving me a cold beer right here. So it's this wonderful economy of the gift. So what changed about a decade later was I, I was no longer providing a service, but I was requesting help probably a little more sincerely though. Um, so again, the gift economy was switched, but the, the idea of a stationary public installation or what I kind of call an intervention, intervention was kind of followed here. But I did offer my uh, participants, my teachers essentially, souvenirs to take home. And these are all NCR photographs. And I had crafted a lesson plan around these that, so it, even though I was a student, I kind of had to make my own, my own lesson plan. So what does all this have to do with at table? It does bring us back to the title image. And I ask, what do these three photographs all have in common? Well, there's, all a, there's a table in each of these, which is obviously used to, to different purposes. But it does allow me to segue back to the topic at hand, at table. You've noticed that I've crossed out 2020 here. I know that many of us would like to cross out 2020 as well. Part of the reason is that I had set uh, the plan of the 
years this year with trips. I mean, all over. I was supposed to be teaching in Berlin and in Prague this summer and visiting New Orleans and uh, Bogotá and a number of other places. And obviously that did not happen here. But um, another consequence of the uh, COVID was that, oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Am I still, you still with me? There was a little bit of a slowing, but now we can hear you well. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> cool. All right. So this is just a, a, a design from an article that came out in University of Dayton magazine in March. And I've never seen the print version of this. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people haven't because we were all sent home the week that this, that this came out. Um, the work was also showing in, in Barcelona at the time, and I'm, I'm really glad I didn't go there. Um, but what just kind of introduced this to you, in, instead of reading this essay that I had written that no one has seen in, in, in person, I'm going to read from something that I've written for a publication that will be available to purchase through Blue Sky very, very, very soon, I believe. Um, so I'm gonna just jump into some actual reading here. This is At Table, A Visual Anthropology of Food, Drink, and Togetherness. In the beginning, there was Fellini. I met Fellini at a table and I said goodbye to her at one as well. That was some 15 years ago. Fellini was a photographer in the US Navy, a restaurateur in Los Angeles, a lovable neighborhood curmudgeon in West Hollywood, and a friend to many. On her walks around WeHo, she was rarely seen without her black jogging suit, purple sunglasses, gold chain, and cigarette. At the time I met this extraordinary, I was a student of photography, one of many in Los Angeles with elusive dreams and empty bank accounts. As I hosted photo shoots on a lawn shared with a complex of interconnected neighbors, Fellini would often happen by, cane gesturing in hand, and declare in something like an East Coast accent, who do you think you are, Glendale? Francis Ford Coppola or something? That joke made her laugh every time. About three years after I met Lorraine Fellini, she was diagnosed with terminal bone cancer. She hated sharing this news with others as much as she hated being photographed. Sorry, that just kind of teared me up. I didn't expect. Um, I had recently switched from film to digital photography, a fact that brought some derision from the hardcore analog crew at that distant time. For years, I had been staging elaborate constructed photographs inspired by Fellini, the film director, rather than Fellini, the friend. In a new world managed by memory cards, however, I felt an economic freedom that invited quantity, if not always quality, to my work. I began to turn my lens on candid, everyday moments within my own social groups, seeking a subtle drama in which people collided with objects and places to perform in awkward synchronicity and messy contingency. In retrospect, I was seeking a recipe with doses of Martin Parr's critical humor, Tina Barty's critical distance, and Nan Golden's raw intimacy. As I negotiated this fresh creative territory, hoping to forge a career capturing the likenesses of other humans, whether friends or strangers, Fellini set about her own demise. As I observed the toll her ill health was taking on our close-knit intergenerational community, I also began to question the nature of photography. How was the new expediency of digital capture transformed forming my former practice of slow and measured analog work? How might a photographer collaborate compassionately with her subjects in ways that still evoke critique and humor? What relationship does photography bear to the truth? What is a document? What is a story? What is authenticity? How can all this be resolved around a table? So if you look for Fellini, you will find her here in this book and right now here on the screen. She's seated behind a green plastic tablecloth in her signature outfit. Uh, our white haired friend Mimi, another beloved member of a team deemed the lesbian golden girls, gazes upward at Fellini's smoking arm, the one gesturing off camera towards the French Normandy style building where we lived as tenants of generous Holocaust survivors. Our rents were always well below market value. And in fact, I'll mention that uh, one of my neighbors 
at this time is the person I'm staying with here in Portland. So this photograph is, is pretty special to us. Um, but I'll continue a bit from the essay. We're good with time. When she offered her likeness on that holiday, little did Lorraine know that she had launched what has become a lifelong quest to capture the domestic moments I have shared with people like Fellini. As an only child growing up in semi-rural California, I didn't dream much of toys or dolls or whatever little girls dream about. Rather, I fell asleep to the vision of an ever-growing family portrait that included an array of people who did not necessarily look like me. Most nights I was lulled to sleep by the vision of a photograph composed of humans stepping into unison onto platforms set up for the purpose of image capture. As I drifted off, this mental photo morphed and enlarged to include classmates, teachers, celebrities, pets, and most importantly, faces I had never seen before except perhaps in the pages of my mother's fashion magazines or my grandmother's issues of National Geographic. This ever rising and always expanding singular image of smiling faces to grow beyond the capacity of all past and present photographic aspect ratios. The mind's eye is incredibly accommodating of such height and width, but the camera is not. And so the vision splintered and matured. At table is the result of more than a decade spent visioning and revisioning what it means for a photographer to pursue a diverse and ever morphing family. But the work bears little resemblance to Steichen's intentions with family of man. The series clearly reflects a deeply one person perspective that often reveals my own racial and class based privilege while also highlighting how membership in the white middle class can grant one access to a range of social groups, geographies and experiences that can somehow exhibit strikingly similar characteristics. Whether sampling fish perfectly seasoned by my students in Nanjing, China, such as you see here, Imbibing Shlivovica with an ex-boyfriend's childhood friends in Belgrade, Serbia. Or sharing beers with recent strangers at Liverpool's historic cavern bar, the camera marks me as an observer. However fervently I attempt to participate and belong, I remain a kind of forever outsider with connections to my subjects that often rely on food, drink, and the collective bodily need for sustenance. In Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, I, my students and I grab tacos with deported U.S. veterans who share their stories across political borders. In Ensenada, Mexico, my students, oh sorry, in Ensenada, Mexico, I share birthday cake with family members whose lives exist across well-wrought imaginary borders, what I consider imaginary. In Canada, I share Pilsner Rocal with friends as a nod to our previous lives in the Czech Republic. In the Czech Republic, I share the same beer with former students as we chuckle about the beverage's newfound popularity in the USA. In San Diego, my adopted nephew, and I'll say I have a hard time finding the right word for adopted when in fact, you know, as again, as an only child, I have like nieces and nephews that I'm not blood related to, we'll put it that way. I wish we had better words in English. So my adopted nephew welcomes pizza delivery, while his six-year-old cousin is distracted by a retro episode of The Jeffersons, which was my favorite TV show when I was her age. About a decade later, alongside her cousin, this now teenager displays her favorite Christmas gift, Hillary Clinton's 2016 memoir, What Happened? No, pardon me. 2,000 miles away in my current home of Dayton, Ohio, my friend Ruth and I celebrate the pause offered by a 4th of July afternoon as her grandbaby Yazzie proudly embraces both her doll and a pizza slice. So pizza, connecting people. Years later and just down the street, my also not blood related niece Kisi and her family celebrate the arrival of her baby sister there with a the spoon. Um, so what brings aesthetic continuity to all this is this content is pretty simple standardized vantage point and the consistent use of a bounced flash. Uh, so most people I know don't like to be photographed while they're eating, but they usually eventually come around to my paparazzi-like ways. Closer family members are often annoyed. This is my mother and my late grandmother, but they've gotten used to this as the project has, has moved over through the years. And I mentioned that another interesting aspect about this 
happening over such a period of time is that I've gone through a lot of generations of cameras, all of them Canons. And as the technology has changed, so have my connections to the medium. I have grown from the 11 year old who used the camera as a way to connect with her emotionally distant father to the young adult eager to make unexpected creative statements, to the graduate student pumped up with history and theory, and finally to the artist and educator who embraces photography as a medium for not only self-expression, but also social change. So um, although at table is not, you know, uh, explicitly socially engaged art, the field of art and social practice has melded with my own artistic practice. I, I teach that at the University of Dayton. So my current work within the local community often uses food culture as a means to address harder questions around racism, hunger, and social inequity. This is a 28 solicited the community to lend me tables for a month. So these tables served, of, of course, as a place for people to hang out during the exhibition, but we also had educational programming and meetings there um, throughout that month. But my main work around food justice in the community is through a partnership co-founded with students and other professors with Dr. Ruth Thompson Miller from sociology and the artist uh, Issa Randall, who's based in the UK now. We founded uh, the Desert Kitchen Collective, again, as a way to educate people about food insecurity. So there's a lot of moving parts. And again, I want to keep a mind on time here. This is an exhibition, a yearly exhibition and fundraiser. So students sell work to benefit, uh, at this point, Gem City Market. We also work with the food bank. Uh, there's usually an interactive exhibit and most importantly, a dinner performance where we invite certain members from the community and we have spectators watching as they do a kind of poverty simulation that aims to reinforce issues of lack and access. But we also celebrate local culture. This was two years ago um, where we worked with lo local Latin American immigrant owned businesses. And uh, my friend Manuel there is making pupusas in the gallery. Below him is the president, Eric Spina, who is a big supporter of the arts at our university. And he's looking at a magazine we put out that year which students you know, took these photographs and, and did all of the design to feature certain business owners. Uh, last year, exactly a year ago, like uh, on the 7th, we hosted No Space Like Home, which was also uh, a collaboration with other courses that had sustainability and engineering majors within them as well. So my, really our aims are to make this very transdisciplinary in nature but we looked at redlining very specifically, which is what we continue to, to look at as we discuss notions of, of house and home and food justice. So out of that year, uh, we had started work on a publication. So then my art and social practice class co collects all of this content and then often we need, we need more for a publication. So my studio lighting students in the spring will create new content for that. And we photographed key community organizers and also everyday people who were sharing their stories of food insecurity. So this content here on the screen was meant to come out in a printed publication in, in April and it did not. So we're updating that and we'll be publishing in 2021. So that just brings me back to how I've shown at table in the past. Um, this really doesn't live up to, to photography very well, but I do love to design custom made wallpapers to show the work on. Obviously it's a quite baroque way to deal with the situation, but these are uh, the, the designs themselves are photographs of the current leaders of all the countries represented in the photographs. And they're all photos of, people eating food. So those leaders are all eating food. And this is at Roy G. Biv Gallery in Columbus, Ohio, where we had, we were able to have guests come and we had quite nice openings. And we also had some educational programming associated with, with it. So I could have um, these little invitations designed and inside the envelope, you were able to take these cards, one which tells you information about 
food insecurity within Ohio. And the other gives you instructions about how to make your own mark on the At Table archive. So I've collected about 100 uh, from this, I just started doing this last year, but 100 little editions of At Table photographs in which people write their own memories or thoughts on the back. Shout out to the typographer, Misty Thomas Trout, amazing designer. So this brings me uh, back to where that table was actually going when the pandemic started. I was working to create a separate book of families within our trade area of the market, which again is where I also live. Um, but that's gonna be on hold for a little while. So I want to offer a, a little end to our evening by coming back to what we have in the meantime before that happens. So in the meantime, uh, what you have here is a collection of memories and artifacts that represent a wide trajectory of my work as an image maker. Time and perspective have allowed me to distill thousands of files down to what you hold here. This is for the book. A signature concoction meant to be potent, but relatively smooth. Rather than a broad atlas of shared cold range of demographic, at table offers a distinctive map of well-worn pathways and stops. Rather than an archive of wide travels, the work has become an album of specific visits and returns across an idiosyncratic cross-cultural geography. The images stick and congeal around certain cities and reflect specific epochs in a select range of countries. What they all share is a reflection of my overarching belief in radical hospitality, active togetherness, and the kindness of both friends and strangers. These recorded experiences in all of their awkward beauty or chaotic authenticity have generally resulted from the hospitable, hospitable acts of friends, family members, loved ones, and mere acquaintances. Blatantly naive, but stubbornly fervent faith that sitting down together to share food and drink can change hearts, minds, and worlds. The celebration of difference, abundance, and revelry could certainly ring kumbaya to ears that hear such messaging as consensus building rather than authentic diversity. However, at table is more invested in a sentiment found in the historical roots of this folk song before it became the focus of modern cultural derision. When the Gula people of South Carolina rang out for divine intervention in a world that was and is crippled by racism, oppression, and Jim Crow, I am sure they did not offer dinner parties as a solution. When Americans at large began to equate this word with empty virtue signaling is less clear, but you can learn a lot of fascinating stuff through the research of Library of Congress historian Stephen Winnick. Back to Kumbaya though, in keeping with the communal spirit of this music and the popular phrase it engendered, viewers have often looked to At Table as a means to bring happiness to agendas otherwise more serious in tone. I'm happy to oblige such desires for diversity and inclusion. After all, if we can accept Kumbaya to mean come by here, then yes, At Table is a work that embraces and exists as a sincere yet slightly irreverent form of Kumbaya. At Table does ask you to come by here. Like the song, the photo series has adapted to new realities over the years while retaining a consistent strength of purpose. Like the words, the images are also a form of open invitation. For At Table, however, the here is a space you have already been. It may even be a space you are now as you hear these words. This here is a place that aims to become a space for meaningful cross-cultural interaction. The here of that table should be a territory from which you can freely and openly ask, how might a photographer collaborate compassionately with her subjects in ways that still evoke critique and humor? What relationship does photography bear to the truth? How might photography be a truthful fiction? What is a document? What is a story? What is authenticity? How can all of this be resolved around a table? Thank you. Um, on this. Before I turn this back over, uh, you'll notice that I'm ending this on a very solemn looking image. I'm currently making, I'm not making table work right now. It's not safe um, for the most part. So I've been traveling around 
taking photographs of backyards, both people I know and Airbnb hosts and such. So here's a somber image of, of what that table kind of looks like at the moment, but hopefully this will all change soon. Uh, if you want to see more from this backyard series in our own, please check out the Redwood, which is curated by my friend Julia Westerbeek, and please follow Glenna Ghost Places. Thank you. Thank you, Glenna. That was wonderful. Um, I'm going to open it up for I'm any I can questions. start to see people. Oh, yeah. Maybe if you unshare. There we go. There I go. Yay. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to ask them and just unmute yourself and ask. Hi, I'm sorry, but I don't know what you mean by when you say redlining. Uh, so redlining was a, 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 a practice initiated by the banks back in 1937 that basically determined how and to whom they would lend. So they divided up uh, basically neighborhoods, major cities into four different distinct properties, the highest being a green property, which is who you want to lend to, which is wealthy white people, and the lowest uh, that was immigrants and, and people of color, essentially. And that follows us to this day although not you know acknowledged legally the legacy of redlining is something that i think is emerging as as a really important study okay thank you i i recall seeing something about that in the in middletown ohio i live in cincinnati and i saw oh, okay. a, map, a map of maybe it was hamilton ohio where they had mapped out districts uh, the, the rich the poor and the unfortunate uh, so okay thank you mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there's a much better way of, of, of defining that, but that's, that's the gist of it. And there's going to be a great exhibit coming to Dayton. I think it might be coming to Cincinnati as well, though, but it's called Redesign the Red Line, and it's a partnership across tons of disciplines to uh, present this information to all over the United States, really. But we're going to host it in Dayton, Ohio for 2021-2022. Uh, great. I'll look for it. Super. Thank you for that. Yeah. Lena. Hi, Molly. Hi. Um, so as you were describing um, the various projects that you've worked on um, since graduate school, what immediately struck me was the notion of social practice, even before you, you mentioned it. And I'm, so I, was, I was wondering how you describe your practice, um, but you sort of answered that. But I'm wondering, will you continue to work in that way? I mean, I see at tables very collaborative but of course, the other project you did really involved the, the public. Do you see yourself continuing to go in that direction, maybe with your backyard series or otherwise? You know, I think that the backyard series, again, is at present going to be very traditional in, in terms of presenting, you know, uh, imagery and seeking beauty and, and, and all of that. And social practice, what I love about it is that it really resists uh, definition because it's a lot of artists working in not all marginalized artists, but working in marginalized spaces where, you know, we have to be careful about associating ourselves with larger institutions and organizations. So I like that when people ask me what it is and go, I can't answer that <laughs> in a sense. But then I also had started to move away from some of the earlier notions of social practice, which I think sought to antagonize the public. And we have a, too much antagonism in the public sphere right now and too much polarization. So I'm preferring to sort of define what I do as socially engaged. And even where before I'd be like, well, no, I, I'm not a community-based artist because I, I thought what they did was, was, was far more sort of specific. But now I'm very happy to say that, yes, I work in community-based situations and I'm far more interested in, in work that's less about creating that sort of public spectacle and is more about really Sometimes that means you're not making work, though. Sometimes that means you're actually just going to church basements and attending meetings and, mm -hmm. and helping people keep lists. So thank you for the question. I don't know how. I think that what's, we've, now that we've gone into solitude. Um, it's harder to do that, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's, I, I, the first part of the pandemic, I was working a lot with Gem City Market, and we had a lot of things to do, and we had a lot of Zoom meetings. And now that I'm on sabbatical, I've just had the privilege of literally driving away from, from that. So I'm kind of back to the notion that, well, we can as image makers also just go out and look for beautiful 
moments in the and, world. <laughs> and that you do. <laughs> well, if you, if you do come back to Portland after our pandemic uh, shutdown is eased up, uh, you'd be very interested to look into the PSU social practice program. Mm -hmm. they're, they're king the, the PSU program has put a uh, KS Mocha, King School Museum of Contemporary Art, and, uh, and they have visiting artists come and interact with the students. And uh, you, you would enjoy, I think, uh, maybe you could go there at lunchtime. And <laughs> that would be great. I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're like the most famous art and social practice program, I think, in the, in the nation. So. Oh, yeah, it's a leading program in the nation. I think uh, Yu Yang John. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Glenna. So first, uh, I want to thank you for this presentation and your works and really enjoyed that. Uh, I sort of have like two questions. So the first one is kind of jumping, it's kind of like jumping uh, the point of what Molly said about um, how you're going to keep doing your project or like doing new project during the pandemic. I was just thinking about have you have you thought about um, different mode of image making? Because I, uh, I think as a photographer or like an image maker, there are tons of ways of making images. There are ways to make images through, you know, cameras, or there can be uh, cameraless photos. So I'm just wondering, because of the pandemic, have you thought about, you know, um, like, you know, just making photo, making images out of like screenshots because mm -hmm. that's like that's like a big part of the things we're doing, like celebrate holidays, celebrate family uh, reunion just through, you know, Zoom. Like the best thing we can do is just taking screenshots. Thank uh, you for reminding me. I'm taking one right now. Um, <laughs> I think I have screenshots of every, uh, of every meeting I've been in since, since March. And I'm not sure quite what to do with them, but you're absolutely right. I think it's given us such an occasion to think of new ways of making and trying to, one thing, what, what group I was supposed to travel to Appalachia with a group of 17 students and my colleagues in May, and that was canceled. And so we thought, and I was sort of the one who's told my colleagues too, let's just not do this, you know, but instead they went forward with it and they interviewed people on screen and I said, go get their, their family photographs, go get the images they think are important from their own collections. And that, that started a really interesting project. But for me, what it actually did was kind of the opposite. I said, you know, when I first got into photography, I loved to stage things and go out and bring my lights in, into the world and play around with masks and stuff. So I, so I started doing that again. <laughs> but I did start with the notion that we really need to investigate like not just lens based stuff but other ways of, of working with people to celebrate photography during this time if that makes sense <laughs> yeah that, that totally makes Thank sense you. that's a really good answer yeah um and also another one uh, i want to hear more about um, that use of um flash because um i'm 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 i might not uh, catch all the points but I, I but i but i remember you were talking about just have a uh, consistent lighting throughout the whole project. But then I'm just thinking about um, a flash is a really strong light. And that to me, it's kind of, um, you know, a, um, I'm, I'm losing words right now, not, not an invasion, but like, you know, a, a dining table or in a family setting is supposed to be very private, very like, um, uh, in, uh, relatively intim uh, intimate and uh, relatively warm, but then there's like a really harsh flash um, mm -hmm. in the photos, which um, just makes me really in intrigued about your choice of that, other than uh, other than making a really consistent light. And then uh, another extra question based on the flash is that how do you um, get over, I'm not sure if you have it or not, how do you get over that like social pressure of, you know, bring, um, using the flash in a bar, like that photo mm -hmm. in the bar, like you have your subject of your friends over there, but, uh, but also at the same time, there are other strangers, like mm -hmm. how, like as a photographer, how, how did you, how, how did you do that? Like, how did you like come, come over that, like, you know, that social pressure of like using flash in a very public space? And also, yeah, and also about that flash in the private um, dining, dining room. Right. 
That is a, such a good question because um, I, I used to talk about this quite a lot because obviously, yeah, flash is a very invasive way of working and it's, it also is a very commercial way of working. And here I am in these very domestic places, but um, I'm, I'm bouncing the flash, which means it's, it's not going off directly in people's faces, you know, and, and um, I have to negotiate color and distance and things like this with the flash to try to get it consistent. But and I, my student Grace is here and she'll remember what I used to call this. I used to say flashing people into submission, which sounds terrible. Again, in our current environment, I don't like to think of it <laughs> thing like that, but because my, in the beginning, the people who I was around a lot, like Fellini even, we'd be sitting under there. There was a tent above that would really provide a beautiful bounced um, flash at that, that. This is actually that image right here on the card, right? So they would just be like, ah, oh, you're taking pictures again, knock it off. Oh. And then eventually like no one sees the flash anymore. Right. So that's how I got over that. So I had to take a lot of bad photographs and I also had to sit there while other people ate and I, my dinner was going, you know, cold and I eaten trying to wait till people kind of chilled out and about public spaces. I, I don't operate in those as often. Um, and you know, it was interesting to being in China versus being here. I did photograph often with friends out at bars and stuff and no one really said much about it. I try not to show strangers that aren't aware that they're being photographed, right? But at the, the bar photograph in, uh, in Liverpool, I basically went up to those people who were having a, a hell of a good time and I, I wanted to, to join them. <laughs> and so that was a very dark, bar too and it took me a long time to get the the lighting right and they allowed me to just sit there and luckily they were drinking and drink I, I will say one more thing too alcohol can sometimes help people <laughs> be willing to to uh, be photographed but I mean again I say that meaning they these are people I, I know to begin with usually thank you I think a flash makes you more inviting and less sneaky. I yeah. think when you're obviously in front of someone and you're engaged because you comfortably engage with people and you engage with them and you're making the photograph with a flash, that there's nothing uh, uh, hidden for them. You are clear, you're out in the open. And I think that's uh, more relaxing for a person to know that uh, you're up front with your goals with your ideas and with your work. And I think it's good for the people that are surrounding as well. Oh no, she might sneak up on me. You don't sneak up on people. Yeah. You engage yeah. with people. And that's part of what um, adds vibrancy to your work. Thank you, Britt. <laughs> hey, Glenna, you said that all your cameras have been Canons. Mm -hmm. My father gave me my first camera. It was a Canon F1. I'm just curious what type of Canon camera did you first get? Uh, Canon F1 <laughs> from my father. That, that camera was later stolen um, out of a car in Los Angeles. They broke a window. I, I couldn't get anything for it now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's interesting because I've read that brand loyalty in cameras is often just something determined by early in life or whatever. And, and that is absolutely the reason why I, I shoot Canon and why I can't Stand anything else. My father made me. <laughs> Same here. Yeah. My, my photography practice also started with a passed down camera from my father. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? And I think that this is a story for a lot of, of students. We get to get a lot of my students to get them writing because I also like I work with uh, graduating seniors and to, for them to start writing and think about memoirs. There's always an uh, origin story. Where did that first camera come from? So, Glenna, you talked about uh, that Portland also had nice food delivery. And I'm mm -hmm. as the, the, the current version of at table would be to do portraits of your food delivery people delivering you your meals. Yes. That's as <laughs> as you can come in this particular moment to at table, I think. And um, yeah, I could invite them to, to have their portraits made. I think, and I have been in town. I'm not sure if my if my friends are still here. I think Al is here, but you know, I, they have this We're beautiful here. home. Hello, <laughs> they have this beautiful table. We've been here the whole time. 
<laughs> Thank you. They have a beautiful mirror and they have beautiful dogs. And, and you know, even before I, I came here, I had the idea of the table photo I want to make. And, you know, lo and behold, we haven't made it yet, but it, I'm coming for you guys tomorrow night. Um, but so I'll often have these like, like a pre visualizations of something that I want to photograph in a specific person's space, but it hardly ever ends up the way that I've planned it. And that's what was so great about the series when it started because I had been going to Art Center College of Design and there was a great emphasis on, on precision and pre visualization in this kind of commercial world. And I could break free from that and just see where the, the flash basically took us. you have any other questions before we wrap things up? Well, I'll, me I'll mention uh, just a couple things for people who are interested in Glenna's work and kind of the issues that she's dealing with. One is that we ha did a show not very long ago by Christos Palios, which was also about the interactions people have around tables, but it doesn't show a single human being in it. It's shooting down from heaven, basically, onto the tabletop and looking at the sort of food debris and phones and stuff on the table for you to imagine the interactions that Glenna is directly showing you. And then the other one is, I don't know if you guys have been seeing uh, the small acts movies uh, that are made by Steve McQueen on Amazon. There've been three of them released so far. Wow. And the first yeah. one, Mangrove, I, all three of them are great that I've seen so far. But the first one, Mangrove, is about uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean man opening a restaurant which becomes this really important hub in the community and is they're extremely harassed by police and the community rising together to defend it. And it's very related to the issues that Glenna's work is about. And it's completely great. So. Yeah, I just watched all of those this past week and I highly recommend or all of them that are, that are out right now. Steve McQueen's uh, also just the depiction of that, that kind of revelry around food. It brings community together, even while you're facing such dire social situations is why I, I just love this topic. Well, Hi, Lena. Hi, Grace. Oh. Um, I was just wondering if there's a way that we can support Chem City Market from afar during this time. Absolutely. Um, you can go to, and I'll, I'll put this on my own website. Through my website, actually, you can link to the Desert Kitchen Collective. It's uh, desertkitchen.org. And you can go to our community partners drop down menu and you can click on Gem City Market. It takes you directly to a donation page. So essentially, right now, the community raised $4 million. Of course, you know, we did have uh, some banks and others help us out as we should have, but we also, uh, I say we, but the, the, you know, the main people who did this did far more than, than I could ever have done. Um, so, so, but we're always, you know, can use more and all of the, the workers will also be owners, but we have like 2000 some members. So again, it's people always ask me as a co-op. So if you remember, you have to work there. People pay uh, 125, well, sorry, I'm sorry, I can't remember. $100 is like a lifetime membership. But if you have SNAP benefits, you can pay $10. And then we also have like subsidized memberships for different um, situations within the community. So quickest way, go directly to Gem City Market and, and to donate. But also your local food banks, you know, look at, at what they're doing and other, you know, member owned stores in, in areas that are facing issues of gentrification and, and in food deserts, because food deserts are really, even in, you know, what could be considered, um, economically prosperous areas. There are pockets of hunger everywhere. Thank, Thank you, Grace. I have a small, um, small question. It doesn't really relate to everybody. I hope you'll forgive me. But do you make any contact with Judy Walgren? Do you know who she is? We're friends on, on Facebook. I know that you introduced us, I believe. Good. And I, I think <laughs> you all would enjoy Joya Dialogues together. Mm -hmm. She's a, a people person as well. I don't know if she's still on the Pulitzer Committee or not, but I really think, and she became an educator. She left being a, an editor and became an educator. And when I read what she does and what you're involved in, I really think you could find some common bonds there. Cool. I'll reach out to her directly. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Glenna. Um, 
we'll have this talk recorded and uploaded to our YouTube video channel. So if you missed any part of it, um, feel free to check there later and watch it. And um, we also have some programming coming up next week, um, Wednesday the 16th at 5 p.m. we'll be having a virtual portfolio walk with um, some of our 2020 drawers artists. So I hope you'll join us. And then we'll also be doing some other programming coming up the rest of um, this month and next month. So check our website for updates. So, okay. Thanks everyone. And Thanks everybody so yeah. much for being here. Have a great evening. Mm -hmm.